All right, at 11, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm John Lee with St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association. Today is March 19th, 2021, and we are here with our weekly update with uh, Miss Kathy Davis. And uh, uh, Kathy, good to see you, your smiling face. So if you want to fill us in, please feel free. Okay. Um, we, we, Christine is like, don't tell them anything if, until we know for sure. And I'm like, well, I'm going to tell them maybe we'll know. So, uh, <laughs> because we've been burned so many times. But you know, I'm in these calls and these Zoom meetings with judges and tenant advocates and that kind of thing. Christine can't do it anymore because the tenant advocates are all so crazy. But, um, and I can tell you that it's very interesting to me because, you know, the landlords are in this situation because the tenant defaulted. You know, so, but, but the, the presumption is that the landlords are gonna do something wrong. And they're gonna take money from the government and still kick the person out and that kind of thing. And it's just, it's just really amazing to me that these people believe this, but um, social workers and tenant lawyers and what have you. The county has been very disappointing to me because I had a meeting with them in January for their new $30 million ERAP program and they still haven't launched it. So uh, earlier this week, we had a meeting with the presiding judge and there were some people from the county on this meeting um, I feel like it's like, you know, I'm like supposed to be Wonder Woman because every time they bring more people to oppose me and I'm really the only one on our side and I have to, you know, it's like uh, more thugs streaming out of the alley to try to beat me up. Um, but maybe it's a compliment. Maybe no one's been able to take me out so far win an argument. So they keep bringing more on. I don't know. But they are, uh, the presiding judge is, saying that he's going to restart evictions and they wanted to put all these restrictions on this so we were trying to uh you know defeat that um they actually wanted they were trying to convince the judge that the county should have should get to sign off on anybody before they get evicted um the county's not a party to these lawsuits it's a collateral attack on a judgment the only people who could reveal a judgment by the circuit court is the court of appeals and then the Supreme Court. So this, this was all ludicrous. Unfortunately, Judge Barton, um, you know, recognized this so well. And he kept saying to them, do you have any legal authority for this? And then he'd call on me and I'd be like, there's no legal authority because of this, this, and this. And Christine has pointed out, and you know, this is true. I'm the only one who talks about the law in these meetings. Everybody else is all about feelings. You know, no one should be homeless. Well, you know, I tend to agree with that, but pay your rent. <laughs> I mean, if you want to provide free housing for people as a government, then you can do that, you know, assuming the voters will go along with it. But, um, and we have, you know, a section eight systems like that, but in any event, the draft order that we saw and that, like the exceptions that are the exceptions in the city starting as soon as next week and all the evictions starting April 5th. So we haven't seen, they haven't issued this order yet. They've circulated it. We've suggested changes. They incorporated some of the changes we suggested in the meetings um, that we've been having. So we hope that this will go out. We will we will, I will email John with copies of any administrative order as soon as I see it. But we believe that the county will do, um, they've, we've been filing these executions since the shutdown last year or since prior to the shutdown, really. We believe that they will take them in the order they were, they are filed. We're trying to reach someone at the sheriff's office. We haven't confirmed exactly logistically how it will be. But if you have fi if you have gotten a judgment in the past year and you filed an execution and it hasn't been acted on, watch for it to be acted on now, for it to be issued to the sheriff. And then you may know that has to be delivered to the sheriff's department. Um, we hope they're going to let this let us in the building. I think Christine will be able to blow right past the security, but um, we'll see. Uh, and then the sheriff will be calling the contact person on the execution to set up the eviction. Um, if the county gets their way, you're going to have to provide a statement to the a written statement to the sheriff as well, saying that you haven't accepted any ERAP money. 
since they're not even taking applications for this ERAP money yet, you should be able to say this. Of course, of course, if you filed an execution on the judgment and that has since been paid, you can't execute on that judgment anymore. You have to start a new suit. That's always been the law. It's always been you know, wrong to execute on a judgment that's satisfied. So you know that I'm reminding you. I told these people at this meeting that, um, that these are the landlords who are executing on judgments are the landlords who are law abiding. They're the landlords who filed a lawsuit, got service of process. So the tenant had due process, showed up for court in whatever format, you know, Zoom or WebEx or whatever the heck, um, got a judgment, whether it was by default or consent or after a trial, and then paid the money to the sheriff and filed for the execution. These are not landlords who are not law abiding. They followed the legal process the whole way. Why do you think they're going to stop doing that now? And, you know, for the most part in the rent and possessions, if you get paid, you're good. That's what the rent and possessions for. So if the county, you know, they're touting to me that this ERAP is going to be very expansive and the amounts are going to be larger and, you know, that kind of thing. If they pay you off, then you're paid off. That's great. Of course, as before with the various programs that have been floating around, if you have to sign something to get the money and you have any hesitations or questions about that, run it by us or your other lawyer, if you're not loyal to me, and um, let us, you know, let us advise you about what it means. Since they were trying to put restrictions on us at this meeting earlier this week, before they had even given out the details of the program or rolled it out, I'm not even sure what to warn you about, about what they're going to be asking for. It could be anything, but, um, and I don't even know yet if they are going to allow landlords to apply directly as we had requested, or if they're going to allow the rent and possession judgment to be prima facie evidence as it should be um, of the facts contained in that judgment, the identity of the landlord, the tenant, the property address, the rent that's due. So we'll see. They also were talking about another new program that's going to be rolled out. And maybe this is with the $1.9 trillion bill. I don't know. But it's SAFER, S-A-F-H-R. We don't have any idea what that's going to be. But apparently there's more money coming down the pike after this $30 million in county ERAP money. That a date was bandied around a little bit about March 29th. Um, so I would say keep an eye on the county website um, to find out when this new ERAP program is going to open and what the requirements are going to be, if you can apply directly, you know, that kind of thing. I also tried to explain to them, because most of them didn't seem to understand how the eviction process works, but there are people that are holed up in their units who are not going to move or do anything or call anybody until they get the sheriff's sticker posted you know, that, that happens about a week prior to the eviction. And there's one lawyer on there, Professor Tokars, um, who like she basically agreed with me. She gets it now. She's been trying to work with these tenants for a year. And there's some that just won't apply, won't follow up, won't get the free money, you know, whatever. They won't do it. And there are some tenants that, you know, are experienced at uh, playing this game and they will drag it out as long as they can. But we believe that once the sheriff starts going out and posting the properties that the eviction's coming, that a lot of the properties will be vacated or the people will be in contact. So wait for that to happen. We think that they, they claimed that there were 562 executions pending. This is applications for writ to the sheriff where judgments have already been rendered. There may be other landlords who have been holding off on even filing the writs until they knew they were going to be executed. So there could be more that get pumped through the system right away. Um, so if you have a judgment and you haven't filed a writ yet, you might want to get that on file because like I said, we think they're going to do it oldest to newest. Um, and there's a good chance it's going to be starting in a week or two. And if they are starting doing the executions April 5th, they might start posting the week before that. I hope they do. I hope they do. Um, so that's our county news. And the city news is still the same. There's a stay on all but those categories that we've talked about before until April 5th. However, the city presiding judge is not going to stop evictions there if the county's allowing them. We think they're going to go kind of hand in hand. 
and we think that maybe the county judge chose April 5th as the date because that's when the city stay is up. And we think that maybe the city judge told the county judge, yeah, I'm ending the stay. I'm ending all stays on April 5th. We still don't know anything about the new city money program, their ERAP or whatever they're going to call it. I didn't check this morning, but I've checked earlier in the week and not found any new information there. Um, in other court news, there's a lot of talk about jury trials starting. You may be aware that there's a federal jury trial going on um, in federal court right now where the police officers beat up the undercover police officer. That's been in the news and everything. That's going on in federal court. They have seated a jury and they are seating another jury next week. This is a big deal because that's a lot of people. A lot of people have to come into the courtroom and that kind of thing. And the idea that the courts are getting more comfortable with letting large quantities of jurors in is good. There's a um, juror questionnaire that's going out to city residents um, for a trial that's supposed to begin April 12th. It's a death, death penalty triple, triple murder case. And they're trying to pre-screen some of the jurors because they're gonna have, for that kind of case, you have to have a lot of jurors called in. And those people are gonna be sequestered for six weeks, um, those jurors. So that's gonna be a thing, if you know what I mean. But that's huge to me too, because if the if they're willing to start this stuff, um, they're willing to start letting all those jurors in, they're going to let the rest of us in soon. And oh, the vaccination news is good. I will show you today. Um, I may have told some of you I'm in the Johnson and Johnson trial. And today I had my unblinding appointment and I told them that I expected to have like a butler, like a Sean Connery in white tie and tails with an English accent coming in flanked by some doctors in pristine white coats with a silver tray and an engraved envelope with my name that I could open and find out if I had already been vaccinated. Because I got the shot December 1st and I didn't know if it was the real thing or a placebo. But no, they just kind of slapped this card down and it turns out I was already vaccinated December 1st. This makes me feel, and it, Johnson & Johnson is one and done, so I'm vaccinated. Uh, makes me feel a lot better about my trial in Hillsboro next week because that's in person and you know the Hillsboro people are a little crazy about the masks and the courtrooms are really tiny so um, I'm good to go and a lot of other people are if you've been watching the news that rollout is happening um, one of the reasons why we're getting the evictions in the county or the stated reason is because the delicate flowers of the sheriff's office have all been vaccinated now and therefore it's safe for them to go outside um, the rest of us have all been going outside and going to the store and doing all these things all along. But, you know, the sheriffs were a special, um, fragile little bunch. So uh, the more that gets rolled out successfully, the faster we're going to be on everything else. We have filed our takings lawsuit. Now, we don't know. We filed that last week and we talked to Judge Burton about it last week. This is the lawsuit where we're saying that depriving us of our property by not allowing us to evict people when we have valid judgments is a taking by the government of our rights to the property. This is a constitutional theory we've been batting about for a while. We felt that it was viable. We just wanted to be really careful and do good research. And so we filed it last week and we called Judge Burton and told him, because we're suing him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the girl that's suing all the judges. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so eager to be back in court. They might be not happy to see me, but, um, and he uh, said that, um, you know, he said he would accept service and everything. And I mean, I think a lot of people are actually suing him. So I don't, I hope it's not that big a deal, but it was a couple of days after that when all of a sudden these proposed orders started coming out about, oh yeah, we're gonna start evictions again and that kind of thing. So one of my co-counsel on that case says, Kathy, you should take credit for this because I don't know if he would have moved this fast if we hadn't, of this suit, and that might be true. So I'll take credit if it's due. Um, I want to thank uh, Dave at Soto Properties, who's been keeping me updated with his struggles with the state ERAP program, which are, as others reported, that it's just about impossible to fill out the forms in a way that they will accept, and they will bounce back for any micro mistake or difference. If you are filing that you're at 123 Main, they want it to say 123 Main Street, or if you say Main Avenue and it's Main Street, I mean, they are just extremely freaking picky. And I know that 
all of us are working hard, particularly in these times, and to have to go around and around on that, I'm sure is very frustrating. Um, someone had emailed me a squatter question and we didn't get to it last week, which I apologize for, but um, they wanted me to discuss the whole idea of squatting um, on this talk. And I wanna tell that person, I think they're on the call today, to feel free to call me and discuss it more or call Chris, but the basic you know, facts are someone moves into the property without um, telling you or you know, having a lease or you know, they just kind of squat. Um, sometimes in some jurisdictions, the police will put those people out. If you call them and you, know, you show up and you have the deed or you're right to the property. We had a situation um, a couple of months ago where the squatters were smart because not only had they moved in, but they had forged a lease and the police were unwilling to decide right there on the sidewalk if that lease was valid or not, or that kind of thing. So they made us go to court. Um, we can always sue these people out. Some things to do, if you buy a property that has someone in that's not documented to you, you haven't received an assignment of lease, offer them a nominal rent for a couple of months because if they pay it, say, you can pay me a hundred bucks for two months and then we'll negotiate a lease. And if they pay that hundred bucks, just one time, you've created a landlord tenant relationship. And then since they don't have a lease yet, it's a month to month tenancy, you can give them a month's notice of terminate and the lawsuit will be much more simple. Now, not everyone will do that, but that's one thing to try. And the second thing of course, is the time honored cash for keys. Um, we urge everyone to be careful about that and make sure that they get something in writing and they don't necessarily give the cash until the person's gone. We like to see a written declaration from them that they've surrendered possession to the premises and you know turning in the keys is the gold standard of surrendering possession put in there that if they leave any belongings behind that they're abandoned and they don't want them and you know that kind of thing um so that's my basic squatter info um those are my two ways that I think can work. If you have a squatter in there and you can't do that and the police won't put won't kick them out for you, then it's probably an ejectment lawsuit. Those are circuit court and they can take longer and cost more. Um, okay, so I don't have anything else in my notes. I'm not going to be here next week because um, I have Max for the day. It's his spring break. Uh, Chris and Bonnie are out of town um, until Thursday night. And then Chris and Christine are both in trial on Friday and I'm going to have Max. So we're going to skip you, but if I get information about uh, the county eviction starting or any kind of order or anything, I will send it right away to John and he and Lloyd or whoever do your, the website here can post it or whatever you want to do. As soon as we get something official, we will send it out. But be prepared. If it's not coming April 5th, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. Okay, let me check in the chat. Okay, are text messages legally binding? This is really interesting. I'm on the annual meeting planning committee for the Missouri Bar, and we were just saying that we needed a program in all these electronic communications and how to get them into evidence and that kind of thing. The thing that I don't like about text messages is um, sometimes we can't figure out how to print them. Maybe it depends on what app they're being used with or that kind of thing. Um, it's better to be able to print something out and you know, the traditional method of getting communications in is you have three copies and one goes to the judge and one goes to the other side and one is for your side and you mark them plaintiff's exhibit one and, you know, everybody sees it. Um, you know, as far as whether a text message is legal bi legally binding, it's as legally binding as any other representation. It's probably slightly better than a completely oral communication because, you know, you do, you do have something in writing. Um, if a tenant is texting you and saying, I've moved out of the premises. Yeah, that's something I'd keep. Um, I would text back and ask them, do you have anything left in the place that you want? And are you, where are you putting the keys? To me, one of the things the tenants do that I think is just, you know, priceless is, you know, they'll come to court and they'll go, why? Yeah, I'm not responsible for this rent because I moved out a month ago. And I'll say, well, do you have all your things out? Oh no, I still have all my stuff in there. I have to move it what has the landlord suddenly become a free storage shed? I mean, <laughs> you know, out means out. Or I'll say, did you turn the keys in? 
oh yeah, I left them on the kitchen counter. Well, did you let anybody know you did that? I mean, are, are, are we all supposed to be imbued with psychic powers and know when they're gone um, and what part of their stuff they don't want and where, the, where they secreted the keys? It's craziness. Okay, I heard from a mortgage lender I work with that the federal moratorium is extended until June 30th. Does this impact any time? Okay, um, there's a couple of different moratoriums that we're talking about here. Hang on, I need a tissue. Okay, there's a couple of more moratoriums we're talking about here. Um, there's the eviction moratorium and there's also uh, the uh, foreclosure moratorium. The foreclosure moratorium has to do with federally backed loans and you can't foreclose on them while they have that moratorium. And I think that comes along with some maybe concessions in payment and that kind of thing. Um, the federal eviction moratorium currently has actually been struck down by two courts in Ohio and Texas and is up on appeal. Um, however, even if um, that striking down gets overturned and the courts uphold the eviction moratorium, the tenant still has to do that thing where they file the declaration with you. And then if they do that, you can have a hearing on that and determine whether they have um, complied with the terms of that declaration, whether they are honest in what they are declaring. And those things include that they've tried to make some payments and that they've applied for assistance. We lost the first couple of ones of those that we did last fall but now we're starting to win them because I think the judges are getting the idea that these tenants are lying when they file these declarations and they're not actually following through and getting money and that kind of thing. Because if they applied for the money and paid you or you got paid by the assistance program, you wouldn't need to evict them, right? And those that eviction moratorium does not apply to anything other than non-payment of rent. It doesn't apply to people who are being evicted for other reasons, for behavioral reasons, or because their lease is up or that kind of thing. Okay, you guys are all so quiet today. I hope you're laughing with your mutes on at my jokes. <laughs> you have I can to see laugh. Him laughing. <laughs> so anybody else got anything for me? There's another thing in the chat room. Oh, there is. Okay. Oh, that was the the, more, the federal moratorium question. Oh, that one. Okay. That's the last one I see. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We good? We, thank you. I laugh every week yeah. when you mention the delicate blossoms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should meet these sheriffs. <laughs> we got, we got served with the summons the other day and it, it was wrong on many levels, but, um, the person who served it, it was supposed to be a sheriff serving it and it wasn't. It was, and my assistant reported to me, it was a person in a nice sweater and slacks. And I told the sheriff, that's a friend of mine. I said, as soon as I heard nice sweater and slacks, I knew it wasn't one of the sheriffs. They don't dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these guys, they're mostly guys. There's a few women. They're mostly retired law enforcement. They mostly wear tactical gear. Um, you can be pretty sure they're armed all the time. And uh, you know, that kind of thing. I mean. They don't look like anybody that should be um, afraid of doing an eviction. And I don't think they are. I think this was completely an excuse that was given by the court so that they could not have evictions for a year. This really didn't have any, I mean, I think the sheriffs wanted to go out and do these. They're generally nice people who want to get this job done that they've signed up to do. A lot of them are like I said, retired law enforcement, they're getting some kind of police pension and this supplements their income and gets them out of the house. I imagine spouses would be glad to get them back on the street as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know these guys. <laughs> so uh, that's what I got guys. I'll see you in two Okay, yeah, thank you. Have a good, have a good spring break with your grandson. Thanks. We'll see you in a yeah. couple of weeks. Thanks again, Kathy. Have Everybody, fun with that. We'll see you.